Thank you, Eugene. I'd like to now invite the speakers for panel one to come on stage, please. As they come up, the first panel today, as mentioned by Eugene, will discuss the ruptures and riddles of modernism, singular artistic practices, led by Professor Nora Taylor Elsdorf, Professor of South and Southeast Asian Art History School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Professor Taylor was previously also a visiting professor at the School of Art, Design and Media at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. She is the author of Painters in Hanoi, an ethnography of Vietnamese art, and editor of Studies in Southeast Asian Art, Essays in Honor of Stanley J. O'Connor, as well as numerous articles on modern and contemporary Vietnamese art. She received her PhD from Cornell University, and her research interests include all aspects of Vietnamese contemporary art practices and the history of performance art in Singapore, Vietnam, and Myanmar. Please, Nora. Uh, thank you. Is this on? Yes. <laughs> thank you and welcome and uh, congratulations to the National Gallery Singapore for putting on this wonderful exhibition and symposium. I'm very pleased and honored to be here and thank everyone uh, for the invitation. So my role here is as a discussant or I should say perhaps moderator uh, and I will also introduce the speakers this morning. So I will do that one by one. I will also be keeping time. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then at, after all of the speakers have presented, then I will, open, I will make a few remarks, and then we will open it to questions from the audience only after that. that, that. So our first speaker today is um, Dr. Yin Kerr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Yin Kerr completed her doctoral dissertation on Myanmar's pioneer modern painter, Bagye Ong So, at the University of Paris, Sorbonne, Paris 4. In parallel, she studied Burmese language and civilization at the National Institute of Oriental Languages and Civilizations in Paris. She was also trained in Buddhist studies at the International Theravada Buddhist Missionary University and the International Institute of Abhidhamma. Her research interests include art and art history as variable constructs, the intersections of ancient and modern methods of knowledge and image making, and ways of telling histories of Buddhist art. In parallel with theoretical research within and beyond the discipline of art history, she explores modes of image making through drawing and painting. She has previously taught modern and contemporary Southeast Asian art history at Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts and Nalanda University, um, and curated at the Singapore Art Museum. Her projects as independent researcher, curator, and translator include Video and Art, a History, 1965 to 2010, a selection from the Centre Pompidou and Singapore Art Museum collections from 2010 and 11, and Play Art Film Myanmar Today. She currently teaches art history at the Nanyang Technological University. Her presentation today, uh, Seeing and Rethinking the Modern in and Through Bagye Ong So's uh, Mana Mahekdi Dat Painting at National Gallery Singapore. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you to National Gallery Singapore and Centre Pompidou too for putting together Reframing Modernism and the accompanying public programs. I'll be looking at Baji Ong So today, whose works are in the third gallery of the exhibition. He's regarded as the leading exponent of modern art in Myanmar, of a statue similar to that of Afandi in Indonesia or Phua Hari Patak in Thailand. Mandated by the country's foremost literary giants, Mintu Wen and Zoji, to revitalize traditional Burmese art in the manner of the Bengal school, and sent to Shantani Kitten to study at the Vishwa Bharati University founded by Rabindranath Tagore in 1951 at the age of 27, he was looked upon as the incarnation of the myth of the modern artist and became the subject of countless panegyrics. Of particular interest in the context of reframing modernism is his reaction to comparisons of him with Pablo Picasso. Intended as the highest accolade, they were met with Ong So's vehement opposition. He interpreted them as an insult rather than a compliment or honor. 
Not only was he keenly aware of his divergence from the European model, he was also committed to defending his artistic difference and autonomy amidst the mainstream fetishization of the West as the unique measure of artistic excellence. By looking at a selection of Ongso's works from the late 1980s in the National Gallery's collection, this presentation seeks to set forth the distinction of his artistic modernity on and in his own terms as much as possible. May it serve to rethink and problematize the construct of modern art in the 20th century. In felt tip pen on paper no larger than A4 size, these are examples of what Ongso referred to as Manor Mahait Didat painting. It means in Burmanized Pali and it means in Burmanized Pali the painting and drawing of the fundamental constituents of all phenomena by way of the conscious of the subconscious mind's immense power. The medium, subject matter, palette, and technique are typical of this corpus of works marking the end point of his quest for a modern and Burmese pictorial idiom since the 1950s. On your left is a female figure superimposed on the form of a palm. The woman was Ongso's principal subject matter throughout his career. Beginning with psychological portraits in the late 1940s, followed by formal experimentations on the female body, and finally, the divine female as the yoni and the goddess. On your right is the profile of a Buddha image recognizable by the snail shell coil of hair. Unlike classical Buddha images encountered in museums, its identification is complicated by Ongso's unwanted style of representation. Of the many inscriptions on these works, the circle signs are numerals in Burmese and esoteric scripts. They are also what we see in the horoscope diagrams. The number nine in red on the Buddha's cheek is deemed the most powerful in Burmese numerology. It is often with this number nine that also signed together with ko pua, meaning a second consciousness or person. The circle words indicate the planets of the week with their corresponding numbers. In the inscription on the top of the work on your left reads, a husband who respects his wife will live long. It is true. <laughs> now, more, crypt more cryptic are those on the work on your right. Prominently in English are the words, I draw for you solar energy number nine. The other inscriptions are Burmese uh, Buddhist mantras. While Alahan and Nabayan for averting danger were locally known, Om Mani Pet Me Hum, that is the mantra of Avalokiteshvara, and Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhi Soha from the Mahayanist Heart Sutra were almost unheard of in Theravada in Myanmar. That the former is written in both Burmese and Bengali scripts suggests that Ongso was initiated to it when studying in Bengal in 1951-52. The combination of these elements makes no apparent sense. What does a female nude have to do with a stylized horoscope diagram and numerals deemed sacred? What is the purpose of the many mantras from the different schools of Buddhism? What has solar energy got to do with a Buddha image? What has the second consciousness affiliated to the world of Burmese, Burmese esotericism got to do with art? Why this deliberately naive technique using felt tip pen? How do these esoteric signs and symbols, yantras and mantras work in the norm Bhaji? Most importantly for us, what is modern about them? To answer these questions, I propose to start by examining two defining characteristics of Menor Bahait Di Dat Baji. In Ongso's words, they are, quote, all the traditions of the world, unquote, and, quote, the most advanced of modern art, unquote. At the most superficial level, by all the traditions of the world, also can be understood to mean that this corpus of works ensues three decades of scrupulous investigations into the linguistic rationale of pictorial idioms from all over the world. The inspiration hails from Vishwa Bharati University, whose name in Sanskrit means where the world roosts in one nest. 
art was conceived in terms of its communicational properties akin to language, independently of any hierarchical order on the basis of origins, media, technique, or subject matter. And this artist's purpose was to develop fluency in as many different art forms as possible, so as to be able to respond resourcefully to each task at hand. The reason for foregrounding a great diversity of art forms from all over the world, crafts and fine arts alike, was also to bring about the relativization of Western art, so that the mirage of Westernization as the exclusive means of modernization might dissipate and the artist be released from enslavement to any authoritarian model. This pedagogical strategy channeled Tagore's definition of true modernism as, quote, independence of thought and action, unquote, as well as his conviction in, quote, a wider relationship of humanity, unquote, that could serve as an antidote to imperialism and nationalism of which he was equally skeptical. As such, being equipped with different artistic traditions of the world would have allowed Ongso to see and to think beyond modern Western art as the sole point of reference. Shantini Kitten's shift from the effects of style to intellectual and spiritual autonomy as criteria for true modernism, which would pave the way for his aspiration to picture the mind and to render manifest Buddhist teachings probably also accounts for his disregard for proportion and iconography accuracy in favor of what he referred to as time and space. Indeed, most of his most accomplished works are technically and visually unremarkable. Many examples of Manoha Mahaiti Dat Biji do not even feature any sign or symbol that relays its Buddhist aspiration and subject matter. It is more challenging to understand how also reason these works steeped in ancient thought systems to be modern. It is even more so to fathom how they might be, quote, the most advanced of modern art, unquote. It is not merely Manoa Mahaiti Dadbaji's subject matter that is Buddhist. The Buddha image, Buddhist masters of the esoteric path, mantras and yantras, etc. But also its fabrication process, which relies on mental cultivation and other related psychocosmic tools. For insights on this matter, it is necessary to look back to Shantani Kitten again, where the ancient and the contemporary are conceived as mutually dependent in the creation of the new and the modern. Tagore spoke of the past as a granary whose seeds await harvest. His right-hand man and architect of the art school's pedagogical program, Nanda Lavos, referred to tradition as the protective shell of the embryo of new growth. Also argued for the indispensable symbiosis of the finest of the old and the new in the creation of modern art. For all three, the modern was less a historical moment than a timeless and unceasing process. It was about being inventive in drawing upon all that the past and the present had to offer and devising new means of seeing, picturing, and experiencing them. This paradigm for the mod modern explains Onsu's appreciation of time-honored psychocosmogrammata as methods parallel to modern electronic gadgets, as well as the correspondences he established between disciplines which convention frames as diametrically opposed. Math and art, information technology, and the esoteric sciences, for example. With bodies of knowledge and pictorial strategies from varied spaces and times merged into a single pictorial frame, Manon Mahaiti was hence posited as the sum of all the traditions of the world and the most advanced of modern art. Still, it is not unreasonable to question the artist's arguments for these seemingly magical instruments, which the modern man and woman have been conditioned to deride as superstitious and irrelevant. Without debating on the many meanings attributed to the mantras and yantras, entire books can be devoted to the mantras of Avalokiteshvara and the Heart Sutra alone. The question would be, how do they perform like advanced electronic gadgets in art? 
Grossly simplified, it can be said that oral vibrations and visual rhythms have the capacity to still the mind and activate usually dormant areas of the brain in profound ways that have begun to captivate neuroscientists. In the case of mantras, less important than the literal meaning of is how they function as primal onomatopoeic sounds. This is the reason why the same mantra can be written in different scripts with significant variations in their pronunciation and still be valid. It is also why also abbreviated mantras to markings indicative of rhythms and vibrations. Andre Leroy Gouchon's studies on prehistoric graphic representations of thought have unveiled the logic of radio thinking preceding linear pre-alphabetic thought. Claude Lévi-Strauss Claude has convincingly expounded the persistence of order and rigorous precision of magical thought that are no less than modern science's methods. There is in truth no lack of scholarly work on the universal manner of operation of Manon Mahaiti Dutbeji's esoteric arsenal. Difficulties with their appreciation stem from the confusion between products of technological feat and scientific thinking, as well as the resistance against the unknown and the unseen. But the lack of imagination to grasp something conceptually and the inadequacy of language to express it do not constitute proof of fallacy. The English word consilience comes closest to designating Menorma Haidi Dutbeji's logic of fusing methods and systems from parallel spaces and times. If we delve into Buddhist thought and practice, which was subsequently superposed on Shantini Kitten's teachings, we find in Buddhist Tantra and Zen the suppression of conceptual dualistic thought. Neither the ugly nor the beautiful matters, the erotic and the spiritual are not incompatible. The scientific is also the magical and vice versa. The esoteric and the secular cohabit. The female divine energy conjoins with the Buddhist path and goal of enlightenment, which is theoretically the prerogative of the ordained male in Myanmar's Theravadin tradition. Whatever we see in Monal Mahaiti Dat Biji are ultimately only line and color, existing as they do, free of imputations of conceptual prejudices. Also, zero theory, whose circular form can be read as the numeral zero, the Burmese letter of alphabet Wa the moon, the world, and the bosom all at once, just like the Zen and so epitomizing the fool as well as the void, embodies precisely this transcendence of conceptual labels of the convention order to render manifest the Buddhist ultimate truth of shunyata. Also wrote that he drew and painted the mind, not matter. His subject matter is the manner of operation of the primordial mind. More specifically, it is its transformation from unwholesome to wholesome states co-occurring with the fabrication of each work. The primacy of the stilled mind as the means to do so is reiterated in all his writings. And it is to the practice of meditation that we return to for insights on the seemingly childlike technique of what looks like coloring too. This process is as significant as the end product of art, which correspond, um, corresponds to the development of concentration through the stilling of the conscious mind, primarily by observing the rising and falling of the breath. And it is most likely this up-down cadence that underlies the tightly packed short lines filling the forms and grounds in Menor Mahaiti Dat Biji with his hand moving in tandem with the flux of thoughts and images arriving and seizing in his mind, the repetition of motifs and lines mirrors this mental journey. In other words, the so-called colorings serve the cultivation of concentration. Concentration which also analogized to the energy and power of the sun. It is not without reason that it is the immense power of the subconscious mind, Manor Mahaiti, that is foregrounded in the name of this pictorial idiom, that also is byword in Manor Mahaiti Dat Baji is, I draw or paint for you solar energy like you saw earlier on. These are indeed drawings and paintings of mental, con mental concentration, the fuel for wisdom in Buddhist teachings. Given the ubiquitous emphasis on the mind and artistic creation, the question is how it is understood and manipulated differently in each case. 
always on the topic of how Manor Mahaiti Dutbiji can be seen and understood as modern in its own right. I propose to consider the nature and role of the mind in Onso's art in comparison with surrealist, cubist, and conceptual art. The purpose of meditation and ancient spiritual technology like mantras, yantras, and other esoteric signs and symbols in the stilling of the chattering conscious mind so as to see reality as it is. As such, although Manor Mahaiti Dadbiji and Surrealism share the same interest in the subconscious mind, their means and objectives are starkly different. While many Surrealists recourse to intoxicants can induce states of mind that are comparable with mental absorption achieved through Onsu's methods, spiritual purification is not necessarily the goal. Besides, the mind at work in Manor Mahaiti Dadbiji is a highly cognizant one. As for Cubism, what Manor Mahaiti Dadbiji similarly dispenses with naturalistic likeness, and some of the works do reduce space and form into geometric planes of colors or patterns, its motivation extends beyond Cubism's interest in picturing the reality of the subject matter through a reassembly of its forms from multiple points of view. For also, it was Buddhist ultimate truths such as the law of impermanence behind the inevitable disintegration and regeneration of the fundamental elements making up all phenomena that he aimed to picture. Indeed, the word dat in Manor Mahaiti Dat Biji comes from the Pali word datu, meaning the primary elements that are earth, water, fire, and wind. As for conceptual art, with the shared ascendancy of mental concerns over material, affective, and aesthetic ones, attention needs to be paid to the different minds in Buddhist metaphysics. Consciousnesses and mental factors alone number up to 121 and 52 respectively in the Pali Abhidhamata Sangaha. For one, the conceptual mind generating ideas is definitely not the menor of Menor Mahaiti Dadbiji. On the Buddhist path of spiritual transformation, the thinking mind is to be hushed and stilled, for it is deemed a hindrance to the clear observation and perception of reality as it is, free of man-made labels and prejudices which are inevitable with a discursive mind. Returning to the epithet of Burmese Picasso to conclude, in spite of Onso's refi fierce refusal to be labelled as such, he always identified himself as a modern artist. He is not known to have challenged the construct of the modern, nor that of art, for which there is no equivalent in the Burmese language, and whose inception in Myanmar is paradoxically inextricable from the imperialist agenda he rebelled against. He similarly used these terms he simply used these terms quite freely to communicate and affirm his own vision of a new Burmese art of the 20th century. Regardless of the superficial semblances with Western modernism, the modernity of Manor Mahaiti Dadbiji is more in the historical, cultural, artistic, and spiritual contexts of Myanmar and the region. If there were one aspect of the legacy of Western modernism that also upheld in conjunction with mental cultivation, it was originality as the touchstone of artistic excellence. But originality is not a straightforward litmus test. Original with respect to what and according to whom. In displacing the authority of the West in his vision of true modernism, Tagore emancipated non-Euro-American artists from the impossible situation whereby they could never be perceived as truly original and modern. How original could also have ever been if he had made Western modernism the bedrock of his practice like his fellow Burmese artists? It was only by seeking out alternative and even unlikely resources that he succeeded in formulating a pictorial idiom of universalist aspirations that remained nonetheless true to his geographical, cultural, artistic, intellectual, spiritual, and historical origins. Paradoxically, it is precisely because Manor Mahaiti Dadbaji's interweaving of contextual specificities with a diversity of traditions and innovations from the past and the present the East and the West, the North and the South, is so innovatory and unorthodox 
that it has thus far eluded the radar of professionals and institutions of art from the centers and satellites of Euro-America. Perhaps the aforediscussed synergy between the old and the new and the notion of contextually significant modernisms can serve as more suitable tropes in looking at Earths beyond Europe and North America. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Tay. Um, Professor David Tay is a curator and researcher based at the National University of Singapore. He specializes in Southeast Asian contemporary art. Before moving to Singapore, he worked as an independent curator and critic in Bangkok, realizing diverse exhibitions including Platform in 2006, The More Things Change, the fifth Bangkok Experimental Film Festival in 2008, and Unreal Asia in 2009. His more recent projects include Video Vortex, number seven, uh, Joke Jakarta, 2011, and Transmission at the Jim Thompson Art Center in Bangkok, 2014. His writings have appeared in the journal's third text, After All, Theory, and Cult Theory Culture, and Society, Art Margins, Leap, on Journal and the Bangkok Post, and his new book, Thai Art, Currencies of the Contemporary, will be published in 2007 by the MIT Press. I look forward to reading that. He's also a director of Future Perfect, a gallery and project platform in Singapore. His talk today is titled, Seeing and Rethinking the Modern, uh, sorry, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I read the right. jet lag. Um, <laughs> Untimely Remittance, the Return of Tang Chan. Thank you, Nora, and thank you to the National Gallery of Singapore for having us all. Um, I also want to briefly acknowledge uh, my research collaborators uh, for this work, uh, Claire Veal, Mary Pansanga, and uh, also to acknowledge the support of the Haus der Kultur und der Welt in Berlin for uh, partly funding this research. Okay. In studies of Southeast Asian modern art, the primary frame of reference has been that furnished by the nation. Foundational propositions, such as, for example, John Clark's research on Asian modernities, share the premise that accounting for national particularities will be a prerequisite for any useful historiography of the larger terrain. Contemporary art has been dragged along, somewhat unwillingly, into that framework even as it enters global circulation, and though the sources of its inspiration and its value are increasingly extra-national. So what are the alternatives? Though freighted with awkward colonial and Cold War baggage, a regional perspective might promise a more nuanced account of art's variable currencies. It might better accommodate experiences that overflow the bounds of nation, and it might defer or complicate their conflation under the pretext of art's globalization. For Southeast Asia harbors a worldliness that is no mere symptom of encounter with the West, but reflects older exchanges within Asia, a worldliness much, much older than modernity and nation. Yet despite all of its shared heritage, half a century of area studies, decades of regional exhibition making and the new bureaucratic vogue for an ASEAN economic community, the regional frame has yielded only a handful of scholarly essays. The book that Nora mentioned, which will be out next year, um, is also framed nationally. It's about how Thai contemporary artists negotiate their simultaneous belonging uh, to a national community and to wider ones. And it's motivated also by the failure of national art history to digest what I think are their most interesting and incisive works. Would one even want to be considered current in a nation whose political class has wound back the modernity announced by the end of absolutism in 1932, where critique of that regression is met with draconian punishment, where the contemporary names a global convergence but also arts instrumentalization by the state, but where there is still today no contemporary art collection held in the name of any public. 
Thai artists have excelled abroad under the contemporary banner. And while they may be forgiven for preferring international currency, this has meant complication rather than transcendence of the national frame. So which currencies of the contemporary are generated within the national present and which without? This is a, a latitude that I've tried in the book to encompass with the neologism preternational, if you will pardon the neologism. If the preternatural names that which is inexplicable by ordinary means, which lies beyond the natural and yet is not necessarily supernatural. With the preternational, I've tried to posit a field defined in relation to nation, yet not reducible to its terms or its logic. This beyond may be spatial, cultural, juridical, or temporal. In the spirit of Derrida's contretemps, untimely with respect to some national narrative or destiny, or, as Flores says of the international, complicit in both the nation's aspiration and its inclinations outward. Now, fate was to throw an exemplary case study in my path with the untimely reappearance of an influential but underrated Sino-Thai modernist, the late Zhang Se Tang, in 2013, uh, also known as Tang Chung. Art historically speaking, Chung is nothing if not singular. Yet what made him so interesting is that he was in other respects, demographically, ethnoculturally, more normal than he was exceptional. His individualism is, all, is therefore all the more striking. His uninhibited combination of Asian and Western modes of abstraction, including uh, but not limited to monochromatic minimalism, action painting, as well as concrete poetry, went unrecognized in Thailand for decades. But lately his work has found, suddenly, uh, found its place in the dilating global history of modernism, as we see upstairs, suggesting that the unstable currencies of the international may be realized in an untimely fashion. In 1968, at the age of 34, Chang self-published a modest booklet of experimental poetry, some 42 pages containing arrays of numbers and Thai words. Its contents and its design were unorthodox, conforming to no literary style, modern or traditional, known in Bangkok at the time. Gone were the measures of verse, meter, line, or stanza. Words were instead arranged diagrammatically, visually, by the rudimentary means allowed by a typewriter, repetition, spacing, carriage returns, and full stops, a punctuation mark not used in written Thai. On the black cover, a dark gray photo of the artist reading suggested the ceremonial biographies distributed at the funerals of upper class Thais, a resemblance that reportedly aroused some hostility. In retrospect, such a booklet is apt to appear as a vanguardist provoca provocation by this perennial nonconformist, a forthright departure from both visual and literary conventions of the day. Indeed, it must have been perfectly unrecognizable as modern art, a genre then still confined to the European figurative styles propagated at the National Academy, Silapacon University some six years after the death of its Italian founder, Corrado Ferrocci. Chung's book more resembles the concrete poetry promulgated in the early 50s by the Neuganeris group half, half a world away in Brazil. By the time Chung made his booklet, there were affiliated groups in 19 countries, though Thailand was not among them. Along with abstract paintings and other kinds of drawing, Chung produced thousands of these visual poems over two decades, though research has yet to reveal any connection between him and this transnational movement. His son, guardian of his legacy, calls it concrete poetry, while at the same time crediting Chung with its discovery. But this is not an art historical claim. Such hyperbole is common in Thailand where the appropriation of foreign styles, 
was elementary to modern art and thus didn't detract from an artist's distinction or reputation for innovation. Born poor and Chinese with little education, Zhang was an autodidact and always an outsider. His text works were conditioned by his love of poetry and by his imperfect grasp on the Thai language as a youngster, by a frustration echoed in the almost compulsive reiterative production of these concrete poems. Under the US funded dictatorships of the 60s, Bangkok was modernizing fast. With higher education for a growing middle class came individualism. And while far from bourgeois, Chung was uh, an exemplary individualist. He, he sold uh, uh, or a kind of uh, soybean dessert for a living on the, on the Royal Padang, Sanam Luang in Bangkok. Though chromatically restrained, his abstract canvases throb with the spontaneity of action painting. Eschewing both institutional patronage and the market, he cultivated an image of frenetic and irrepressible creativity in stark contrast with the academicism that reigned at Silopakorn. Though invited to exhibit and lecture there, he remained resolutely outside the academic system until his death in 1990. He was never made a national artist, an honor bestowed by the culture ministry carrying a monthly pension and generous provision for one's funerary biography. Like other artists and poets of his day, Chung avidly pursued both local and foreign cultural traditions. But the key to his exceptional status was his lifelong interest in Chinese literature and philosophy. This set him apart from a great many contemporaries whose Chinese ethnicity was a matter of denial or at best an open secret. He seemed immune to what Kasian Techapira has dubbed Thainus deficiency syndrome, the ethnicizing discourse that has secured the Thai elite's superiority over Bangkok's Chinese mercantile middle class. His poverty was surely some inoculation. But as a Chinese Bangkokian, ethnically, Chung was anything but marginal. His distinction was that he didn't shirk that heritage, but earnestly claimed it. In the early 60s, his bold abstract compositions uh, were imbued, sorry, imbued the gestural immediacy of action painting with an unmistakably calligraphic twist. This intellectual outsider was destined to fall through the coarse net of national recognition and throughout his life made a virtue of this exclusion. From such humble beginnings, his path to nationalization was to prove long indeed longer than a lifetime. Since his death, a few works have wound up in private collections and surveys. He rates a few mentions in Apinan's Art History uh, and a page in the Rama Nine Foundation's online compendium of Thai art. But the great majority of surviving works languish still in the private museum he set up at his house in the rice fields west of Bangkok at the mercy of a hostile climate and in urgent need of restoration, hint, hint. To what community, then, should this legacy be consigned? Nationally speaking, he remains marginal. But recent posthumous exhibitions at Srinakarin Wirat University and a private gallery nearby in 2013 have ca catapulted his oeuvre into much wider circulation. So uh, an aside note here, um, to put this NGS outing in context, um, the only prior foreign excursions of Chung's visual art uh, were to Singapore and KL in 1967, uh, a Japan Foundation survey, Asian Modernism, uh, in Tokyo in 1995, which toured then to Manila and Jakarta, and the Singapore Art Museum's Modernity and Beyond in 1996. The 2013 shows prompted a surge of international interest. Paintings and works on paper have been shown in the 2014 Shanghai Biennale, uh, a show called The World is Our Home earlier this year at Parasite in Hong Kong uh, and in the present exhibition. Now, a modernist he may have been, but the value rapidly accruing to his work today stems not from its modernity but from its less tangible contemporaneity consisting in his conceptual preoccupations perhaps more 
than in his practical experimentation. His individualism and spontaneous physicality were certainly remarkable, but for a global contemporary audience, not blinkered by nationalist orthodoxies, there may be a stronger appeal in his more modest and prosaic habits, like the meditative daily reiterations of his poetry drawings or his abiding literary inclinations. In any case, this modernist's contemporaneity has revealed itself to a regional and an international gaze before it has become apparent to Taiwan's. National formation has always required national subject formation. If the former was the work of politics, the latter was very often the task of art. Such narrative bonds furnished what Ben Anderson called the nation's sociological solidity, the lives of people serving as analogues for the life of a people. Protagonists, not simply subject to a given national history, but subjects of it, co-authors of the nation's fate. Thus, the printed word has set the scene for the travails of de decolonization and national awakening as in Anderson's magisterial study of imagined communities. Yet this embodiment is perhaps not as universal as we might like to think. Thailand's entry into a free world, its stake, for example, in a liberalism distinguished by pluralist rather than chauvinist nationalism, was little advanced by World War II. Thailand's militarist keepers, as we know, sided with fascism. Despite its unambiguous alignment with the United States since, this freedom has carried few of the gains supposedly secured in those struggles, a hollowness that resounds in the retrograde and dysfunctional nature of its supposedly constitutional monarchy today. This unfree alignment with a free world was the backdrop of Zhang's modernism, but he could never have played its national protagonist an identification that Siamese historiography has largely reserved for kings and princes. In his insightful study of national building in post-colonial literature, Peng Chia has sought to disentangle the strands of such frustrated liberation. But Thailand has its own unique knot. Its concept of freedom muddled in the early modern era with a no less imaginary notion of ethnicity. And while its modernity owed much to imperialism, Siam's avoidance of formal colonization made for a more tangled crypto-colonial complex and an exceptionalism that has left it outside of the liberatory narratives uh, of decolonization with which Chia deals. Where he emphasizes, Chia emphasizes the potency of culture as an organic incarnational work as in the abstract expressionism touted worldwide by the US during the Cold War. Thai modernity presents yet another deviation, for that abstraction was soon enough accommodated by the Thai Academy, as a style, mind you, not a philosophy. While non-conforming individualism, like Chung's, would go unrewarded and unredeemed for decades to come. Meanwhile, the equality for which Chia's national protagonists strove depended on a certain political modernity, one that was wound back by Thailand's institutions during the Cold War and since. Okay, this, I would suggest, is in loosely in contrast to most of the rest of Southeast Asia. Now, my suggestion here is that uh, a universalist reading of Chung's abstraction as part of this particular international modernist telos would need to be very carefully qualified indeed. In any case, his radicalism was more aesthetic than political. But does this mean that the world it addressed was any smaller? By contrast with the protest art of his day, his abstract painting may appear to Western eyes to be a retreat from Thailand's civil strife. Even his concrete poems of the late 70s seem quiet and cerebral. While some, such as this, refer bluntly to Cold War, Cold War trauma, they neither depict it exactly, nor enter into discourse with its dead. Indeed, for an artist adept in both portraiture and something like action painting, 
in a society scarred by public massacres and shot through with ghosts. What's remarkable about them is their sheer non-corporeality. There is no incarnation here, but rather the inverse, as corpses, dictators, and people, almost always an accumulation of individuals, con and tai, rather than the collective singular prachachon, are abstracted, formalized, boiled down into language. Yet if Chang's abstraction put him on the sidelines of a national struggle in which he could scarcely count himself a contestant, it was also a generalization, adverting to a world beyond that national community. Con may be a Thai word, but Chung's con are simply persons, any persons, and his dictator might be any dictator. And amongst the headlines of the day, God knows there were plenty to choose from. His work could therefore perhaps point to a wider global politics whose poles were surely in Washington and Moscow, but whose protagonists were, and why not primarily, people of the non-West, and to a wider cultural inheritance that included abstract expressionism, perhaps a transnational uh, experimental poetry, but also the Chinese literati tradition, martial arts, and Buddhist meditation practices. What might internationalism have meant to artists working in Bangkok in the 60s? Broaching sympathetic connections across formidable and still hardening political divides, Chung's abstractions were contemporaneous with developments in the West, but at arm's length. And even for his son, asserting their contemporaneity half a century later, their singularity is still more important than any stake in an international heritage of modernism. His formalization of Cold War violence certainly stands apart from its more recent surfacing in contemporary art. For as that violence has finally been declassified, it has become a signal preoccupation of the Southeast Asian contemporary, and very much in the incarnational manner of Chia's spectral nationality. In the book, I contrast Chung's reappearance with contemporary art's recent hauntings by the ghosts of Cold War trauma, a term that is as palpably regional as it is contemporary. And this slide is, in a sense, a, a, a bottled version of that argument. I also offer a typology of the international and related values such as the sarkon in Thai. This word is often translated to mean universal. Um, and these related values that are quite specific, in fact, to Thailand across Chung's lifetime and since. For if understanding modern art demands detailed national histories, the understanding of contemporary art, and perhaps of modernism too, will demand no less specific histories of the international. The modernity shared, contested, and circulating intra-regionally one of many layers of internationalism has only recently won the attention of researchers, and we should acknowledge this institution's very ambitious attempts to encompass it, whatever we may think of the results so far. However idiosyncratic his art, Chung's experience as a locally born Chinese Southeast Asian was, again, far from singular. Similar alienation and racist associations with communism plagued the region's diaspora throughout the Cold War, compounding the earlier discriminations of colonial regimes. We may only imagine the reception that his work might have received when shown here in 1967, in a newborn post-colonial state whose Chinese majority, desperate to anchor itself culturally in the region, was anxious for alternatives to the leftist social realism that had been fermented in its Chinese schools. Chang's concrete poems would not have been recognized as art, like perhaps Cho Cha Hyang's uh, conceptualism dismissed by Singapore's Modern Art Society in 1972. But his calligraphic abstract paintings must have appealed to Singapore's modernists, schooled as many of them were in the progressive Chinese nationalism of the May 4th movement. If the concrete poems seem current to us now, it's because they resemble conceptual tendencies in 60s and 70s art elsewhere. Tendencies lately discovered 
to be foundations of our global contemporary. But whether or not they belonged to any international movement, it is their perceived non-tire characteristics that prevented the artist's canonization and underwrote, without ever explaining, their exceptional status. Chung himself never left Thailand. His works are through and through the products of Cold War era Bangkok. But the diasporic experience he left visible on their surface, in which so many fellow Chinese Bangkokians refuse to recognize themselves, is ripe for re-evaluation now, as an economically ascendant China re-inscribes itself in the dilating transnational intellectual histories of Asia. It may be fitting, too, that remittance for Chung's contribution, so long left off the National Art Historical Register, should come in international currencies rather than national ones. Thanks. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Emily Gouda, um, who is a visiting researcher at the École des, des Hautes Études en Sciences, Sciences Sociales, or CADES. She has a PhD in art history from uh, the Paris West University of Nanterre, La Défense, with a dissertation titled France Faces Her History, Visual Artists and the Algerian War from 1954 to Nowadays. She was a scholarship holder of the French Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs at the Institut de Recherche sur le Maghreb Contemporain from 2007 to 2009, and before that, a research assistant at the Deutsche Forum für Kunstgeschichte. Her publications include uh, Le Musée d'Art Moderne d'Alger, De l'Utopie au Musée en Devenir, meaning the Modern Art Museum of Algiers. Um, from Utopia to a Future Museum um, that appeared in uh, 2013. Uh, she also has an article, uh, Représentation artistique postcoloniale des femmes en guerre d'Algérie, Dévoilement du non-histoire, or artistic, uh, postcolonial artistic representations of women in, during the Algerian war in a publication called La Guerre d'Algérie, Le Sexe et les Froids, uh, that appeared in 2016, or on the Algerian gender and fear in the Algerian war. And a book from her dissertation will be published in 2017. Uh, her presentation today is on Jean-Michel Atlan, one of the artists in the exhibition, um, Beyond the Borders of Modernism. Thank you. At first, I want to thank you all the team of uh, National Gallery Singapore for this uh, happy invitation. <laughs> it's the first time for me in Asia, so thank you. <laughs> so, abstraction, primi primitivism, abstract expressionism, abstract lyricism, non-figuration, and finally, new orientalism, all these qualifications are given to describe and try to define Atlan's painting. Atlan's work presents many difficulties for art appreciation and for his classification as a modernist. Modern or artist of the two mondes, all words, it's a glissant concept. Before the term was coined at the end of the century, how can we now speak about his work from an historical view? viewpoint. As Atlan himself said, on the contrary, I think that which characterizes my approach of yesterday as that of today is an unclassifi unclassifiable and visionary part of my painting and the, the impossibility for the viewer or art critic to use the usual terminology of figuration and no figuration and abstraction to describe it. They were the real adventure is, and not just a trend. Here, Atlan questions the borders of classification of modern art. It's a fact. And its place today in a reframing of modernism makes total sense here, unclassified maybe. 
Let's consider the historical context of his work and try to investigate some elements to understand his relevant, student, but significant intrusion in art history. Now today, as a figure as, uh, of the post-war school of Paris, Nouvelle École de Paris, Jean-Michel Atlan was not destined at first for an artistic career. Born in 1930, 13, sorry, in Constantine, in the context of colonial Algeria, immigrated to Paris in the 1930 in order to study philosophy at the Sorbonne. After writing a dissertation about Marxist dialectic and an aggregation, he taught philosophy for several years at the high school and was actively involved in the Trotskyist movement. In 1914-40, Atlan was removed from his position by the anti-Semitic anti laws created under the Vichy government. After that, Atlan and his wife, Denise, were engaged in the resistance. resistance they were arrested in 1942, and Atlan, who feigned madness, was interned in Saint Anne, a psychiatric hospital in Paris. It was in this period that he began his paint and poetic activities. One of his first pieces, Three and Figure, show an interest of metamorphosis and natural patterns. A central figure seems to merge with the tree and erodes the organic, the organic form by a first disintegration of the figure. Given his intellectual training and writing abilities, Atlan was the main commentator of his paintings. His personal artistic approach was born by a strong and substanti substantiated rhetoric of his creative process, which also reverts a resistance to classification and trend in artistic movement. Atlan defined his approach as a transverse concept organized around an expression of the magical way and the reason. The act of painting becomes, uh, becomes a poetic being in the world, such the gestural, gestural trace of movement and the creation of moving forms. I quote Atlan here. One day, I wrote somewhere that my form have neither a passport nor an identity. They just exist with an unacceptable violence. In his texts and interviews, Atlan said that he was inspired by the magical aspect of art and gladly acknowledges the relevance of primitive artwork as well as the great master of European art. He declares so. Primitive men believe they made magic when they create a piece of art. And we, we believe we make art, realize even more fearsome magical forces. The exhibition Reforming Modernism offered us an opportunity to discover six of Atlant's works of art. We can see one of his first works here, Perpetual Landscape which eliminated the painter's special interest for the medium. The material is heavy, and the canvas is completely saturated by colored combinates by darkness. All the characteristic elements of Atlan's style are present here. It's interesting to consider the title of perpetual movement, such which is produced is energized. The sinusoidal lines burn open in the center of the composition for where uh, where the brightness also emerge. The Mirror of Asia is a work which we must include in a series of paintings dedicated to the subject of magic mirror patterns. There are a lot, uh, there was a series named uh, The Mirror of Solomon, too. This painting, who was exposed in the Japan, where we can identify uh, the mirror in the central rectilinear, fa rectilinear form, sorry, <laughs> shows a quest to solve the duality between abstraction and figuration. 
The form are floating in the area of the canvas and seems to dance to the rhythm of the black, lines, black looping lines. Form and distinguished contrast between black lines and chord area are the earth of Atlant painting. These symbolic elements are present in order to create a rhythm and translate, I quote here Atlant, vision of reality, not reality itself. However, let's keep in mind that the title, which didn't have a rule in Atlant artistic process, is used by the painter only as a poetic suggestion. I quote Atlant. At lawyer. If often take refuge, refuge in a poetic geography, Calcutta, Sahara, Asia, etc., names which remind me at the same time of lands, landscape, and myths. At, at law also play with the polysemy of words as a possible key of, exper of experimentation of his living form, but his title shows the multiplicity and non hierarchic inspiration of his sources. There be the Mesopotamia and the Kaina, which are ex exhibited today, remind us of the sources of Oriental geography and mysticism. In order to transgress the border of geography, Atlas summons the liberty of, of the myth and the imaginary. The Kaina, a mythic fortune teller and symbolic historical figure of the Berber resistance against the Arab invasion in the 17th, 17th century, is transcribed by a sinusoidal trace which structures a different color area of the canvas. From this protein signs, we can see not only a dancing figure feminine figure, but also, from another more distant point of view, an evocation of symbolic map crossed by black rivers. So the magical ascendance and the violence of the rhythm Atlant's painting, born in the context of two wars, World War II and Algerian War, creates a new visual semiology with its limited geography and uses the singularity of the painting of the sign as defini definite defined, sorry, by l'école du signe in Algeria after the independence to transcribe a reality of vision which explores the plasticity of painting in a carnal relationship in the animate page picture material. Pioneer of modern Algeria painting. Mohamed Khadda a major independent Algerian painter and theorist of the less alienate painting of, and culture from Algeria, celebrates Atlant's heritage when he writes. We must, we, must also point out, we must also point out that some French artists we knew in their works how to translate a real attachment to an Algeria of which they were native for the most part. Atlan, the Constantinian, who passed prematurely away, is a pioneer and offers modern Algerian painting. All his works are barbaric rhythm of the rumor, gorge, and the airy which make up Constantine. If we look briefly at the work of Hadda and other Algerian painters since independence, we can easily find the, this heritage, especially in the Ecole du Noun, School of the Sign. Noun is a uh, sign in the uh, Arabic language. Reading Radha, reading Radha on Occidental modernism is really worthwhile. Um, and uh, in his Element for New Art in 1972, the analysis of Occidental abstraction by Khadda uh, established an affiliation between Arabic art with its, geometry, with its geometric and working of Arabesque pattern as a source of modern art. He said also, I quote, in the Western art which we rejected, we were going to discover our own roots. We can surmise that the reference to Atlant is evoked in order to recognize the, multi the multiple modernity between extra-occidental and western point of view, Atlant becoming 
an intercessor between two narratives form. As I wrote in my dissertation about the international visual artists who faced the origin of the war, the reappropriation of modernism reverses a decolonization process by Algerian artists. In the construction of independent Algerian painting, painters pursued the non-figuration as a reaction to normative figuration of the Orientalism canon, and such introduced the, subaltern cultu the subaltern cultural actor into a universal history of art. The Orientalist perception in the representation of colonized territory, and finally the figuration, were rejected for the benefit of non-figuration. This reflection seems to be present in the background of Atlan's painting, which reacts a generation before as a contestation of an, of an European perception of modernism, but also face the acculturation current in colonial Algeria. Indeed, Adlan said, I quote here, I was born in Algeria, in Constantine, where pictural concerns were absolutely non-existent. Const Sorry. In Constantine, we could only see the decadence of late Roman sculpture. The museum exhibits one Horace Vernet and military scene of the conquest. Apart from that, they were local painting, painter of the Arabic market genre. In my childhood, I couldn't imagine any painting and sculpture other than the Pompier paint, uh, painting reproduced in my French history book." End quote. This, fili this filiation between Atlan's heritage and modern Algerian painting is not, however, taken into account in the actual writing of the universal history of art, which does not address to those located away from the center of modernity. In this bio uh, biography essay, the thinker Kenneth White considers the colonial di dimension of his analysis of his analysis of Atlant production, and he said, I help you with uh, the text. <laughs> but the word that Atlant knows is a modern word where modernity comes under the sign of colonialism. Colonialism has a grip of, on space. Culture is no doubt at first a sensation of space, real life space, especially when it's about painting. I, I am not insinuating that he, the young Atlan was fully aware of this situation, but I'm sure that the state of sync were impressed in his sensitive fever and that is the result of in two things. One of the, uh, on the one hand, he was getting to attach to what remains sensory and palpable. On the other hand, he was looking for a life dimension situated outside of the colonial framework or of any alienate context. He will use any element of this ground as a metaphor in order to draw the contour of this atopy that we call is Atlantis. Atlan died after a violent concert in 1916. He was well reserved during his life and his friendly relationship with some major figure of French modern art are preserved his work for posterity. The French art critic Michel Ragon published the first monograph of Atlan in 1951 under the title Architect and Wizard. More from the same and other authors will follow. A monographic exhibition was realized in the National Museum of Modern Art Centre Pompidou after his death and a considera considerable catalogue raisonné, descriptive catalogue, with a rich bio uh, biographic essay was published in 1996. Uh, Atlant's works were exhibits on the uh, Atlant's work was exhibits on the international art scene, Paris, Tokyo, New York, Copenhague, during his lifetime and after, and always under the sign of European modernism. 
Atlon was in fact the witness of and the partner to several famous artistic movements and schools, Cobra, Ecole de Paris, Lyrical Abstraction. Also, it is not, uh, he did not affiliate himself to any of them. Jacques Derrida, the terrorist, pardon, <laughs> the theoretician of deconstruction, makes an neck phrases, a literary, a literary commentary about the works of the painter in 2001 uh, and talks about them in the term of loops of writing, hieroglyph, and ideogram, which register actually the artist in the lineage of the school of the sign. Today, I would like to take some time, if I can, yeah. <laughs> um, I would like to take some time to discuss the, act to discuss the, the actual reception of Atlant's works, which pose some problems as to interpretation and definition. We can see that there is a certain disharmony in the present critical reading of his work and his inclusion in the current narrativity, narrative sorry, of the history of art. On the one hand, Antlon was of course present in multiple modernities exhibitions under the curatorship, uh, curatorship of Catherine Grenier at the Centre Pompidou in 2014. It was then recorded in the International Abstraction Register and as a quote in the catalogue by the art historian Fanny Drujon in her essay, Modernities in the Middle East under the sign of artistic plurality. After introducing her text with a quotation by Edouard Said, she evokes the painter in this term. When the li uh, I quote Fanny Drujon, when the Lebanese artist Shafiq Aboud arrived in Paris after World War II, abstraction was the dominant trend. Within it, one tendency, as illustrated for intense by Jean Atlan, was to develop an aesthetic of the sign, partially, uh, partially inspired by oriental motif, Particular, particularly those borrowed from traditional decorative art, which could be attributed to a new type of Orientalism. To think of Atlan's work as a continuation or even the modernization of Orientalism is not only to deny specific historical and personal background of the painting, but also to deny Atlan's artistic intention also clearly expressed in the writing by, uh, by the painter himself. In his, in his aesthetic choice, Atlant seems clearly to engage, voluntarily or involuntarily, in a real deconstruction of the Orientalist canon. It also seems difficult to think today of the artistic output linked to the MENA, Middle East North Africa area, with us recourse to the legal order to establish an affiliation with Orientalism. Maybe we have to find another lexical field or paradigm to account as accu uh, accurately as possible for the scale of his singular artistic practice, which could turn out to be a rich contribution to the decentration of the notion of modernity. On the other hand, in Algeria, the critical fortune of Atlan's work is very restricted, despite the fame of certain Algerian artistic personalities. The historians Anna, uh, Anissa Bouayed and Benjamin Stora try today to reintroduce the, the heritage of Atlan in uh, the history of Algeria, but only a single exhibition in French cultural center of Alger and Constantine in 1966 can be leased to this day. Anissa Boyed emphasizes the absence of Atlan in the biographic dictionary of Algerian artists edited by Mansour Abrous and the laudatory presence of the painters 
in the Benezit Dictionary of Artists, where a short list of Asian modern artists are briefly evoked. Anissa Bouayet writes, I quote, Atlan is absent from a cultural heritage which he contributes to revive and to universalize, causing it to burn into the contemporary artistic scene and showing the surprising modernity of its shapes, end quote. This surprising modernity is already not noticed, noticed by Michel Ragon, who writes, I quote Michel Ragon, you were the pioneer of what I have called for a certain time, another figuration that is the said painting which has nothing to do with the aesthetic of classical abstract art, nor having to do with traditional figurative aesthetics. Let me lock you temporarily temporarily into these drawers to take you out immediately into the full sunlight of your native Africa. Because this North Africa explains your painting as well as the school which, in fact, you never attended. In a transcendent modernist perception as au format du sublime, oversize of sublime, to quote Derrida Stern, Atlan highlights in his painting opening, opening up in the decantation of modernism and it, its origin for the benefit of an imaginary reach of the world impulsation. It's a term for, uh, of Atlan, world impulsation. Within a rhythmic perception of modernism, Atlan builds a disoriented painting such so as the underground maze of an anticipated culture of the two moons, to borrow Gleason term, an in-between area that Kenneth White calls rightly and poetically pictural Atlantis. Thank you. And our last speaker um, for this uh, morning session is uh, Dr. Heidi uh, Arbuckle. Um, she works in Indonesia at the Jakarta office of the Ford Foundation. And before joining Ford in 2007, Heidi spent 12 years in the creative arts and media sector in Indonesia, where she partnered with a broad range of Indonesian organizations. Her book, Taring Padi and the Politics of Radical Cultural Practice in Contemporary Indonesia, was published in 2010 taught at the University of Melbourne in the areas of mass media in Indonesia and gender politics in Southeast Asia. Arbuckle is fluent in Bahasa Indonesia and studied Indonesian literature at the uh, Gajah Mada University in Yogyakarta and visual arts at the Indonesian Institute of the Arts. She holds a PhD in gender and post-colonial studies from the University of Melbourne and a bachelor's degree in anthropology from Curtin University of Technology. Her PhD dissertation is entitled Performing Emiria Sunasa, Reframing the Female Subject in Postcolonial Indonesia. Her talk today um, is uh, Emiria Sunasa, Rewriting the Modern Self Through the Feminine Body. Thank you. Um, I realize I'm, I'm standing between everybody and lunch, so I will not run over time. Um, <laughs> Uh, Emilia Sinasis was the, the subject of my PhD, which I, I completed in 2012, and um, I have not since revisited her, so I'd, I'd really like to thank the um, National Gallery of Singapore for this, this invitation. Um, I, the techniques that I, I used to sort of rewrite and, and reconstruct Emilia was sort of a combination of oral history narrative archival documents and, and textual analysis of her paintings and photographs. So I'll just use these in, in my presentation today. Um, and just start with telling you a little bit about Amelia Sanasa. She was born in 1894 in um, Tanawanka, which is in North Sulawesi um, in Indonesia. And, and during the 1940s, she was also in her, her mid-40s. Um, she became the new nation's most prominent female painter. Um, Sources show that Amir lived this extraordinary life as a, as a nurse, um, a plantation administrator. She was purportedly a, a tiger, an elephant hunter, um, 
she was a herbalist um, and also a businesswoman who, who travelled frequently around the archipelago and also to Europe. Um, and she was reported to have, have married up to, to three times. Um, on one of her marriages, she, she once commented it was to a European man and she, um, she was there for a year or so and, and, and sort of said that she was... She grew tired of the marriage and, and returned to, to Indonesia, and this is at the, the age of 21. <laughs> she also claimed that she was a princess from the island sultanate of Tidore, who fought for Papuan independence from the Dutch. Thank you, pardon. And here she is on the front page of the Straits Times in July 1960. Um, the headline reads, if, if claim proved, she might be the queen of West Irian. The Indonesian government made today it clear its stand on Princess Emilia Sanasa's claim that she was the rightful monarch of West Irian. The matronly princess, who is now in Singapore, has announced that she is on her way to New York to present her claim to the United Nations. And according to some reports, she is backed by a powerful group of finances in, in Singapore. Meanwhile, uh, her friends and family remember Emilia as, as Emi Manopo Pereira from a well-to-do Manadanese, Man Manadanese family. And here she is at a New Year's Eve party in Jakarta in, in 1947. She sits at the back of the photograph, sitting in between Prime Minister Sultan uh, Sharir and, and the from, Foreign Minister Haji Agul Salim. And they're also sort of well-known um, Manadanese Republicans <laughs> in this photo. Now, during the 1960s, Amiri disappeared from Jakarta. Um, there's a lot of conflicting narrative about what happened to Amiria. Um, some say she left, left for the jungles of Sumatra to cure an illness that she was suffering from. Um, others say she started a pepper plantation in Lampung, and, and others even reported that she, she'd be married in, in Malaysia. But it's the mysterious circumstances that, that surround Mrs. Amiria's sort of disappearance that are often used to explain why so few people today have heard the name Amiria Sunasa. Others attribute it to the assumption that she was not in the mainstream, not modern enough, or not close enough to, to President Sukarno, who was, was a chief patron of the arts at the time, and therefore not recognised. And there's also the notion that Miria was not a prolific painter. She was a, she was a hobby painter, which explains why we know so little about her painting today. One of the problems I attempted to address with Amiria was, was her erasure from the writing of modern um, Indonesian art history. And, and in trying to rewrite Amiria as, as a female subject and, and painter, I, I encountered a, a lack of adequate frames to, to reconceptualize her. And what I found was both the discourses of Asian modernism and, and feminist art history, while they had parallels in their critique of modernism as found in the Euro-American tradition, neither had considered, given much consideration to each other's other. So Western feminist art history until recently had paid little attention to the histories of colonized or Indonesian women. And similarly, Asian art histories had largely evaded the challenges posed by Western colonial or local feminisms. And so what my writing of Amiria attempted to do was sort of reconceptualize Amiria's modern female selfhood as a means of theorizing a new relationship between modern gendered subjectivities and post-colonial Indonesian history or art history. And so the framework that I constructed was sort of deploys the feminine tropes of, of princess and the primitive, home and mother, and the feminine body and self. Um, and this frame, I contend, sort of enabled the articulation of, of those feminine spaces um, that had otherwise been negated or othered, um, both in national and, and colonial modernisms. And so the function of these tropes is also to demonstrate how Amiria's sort of slippery, shifting subjectivity was a way for her to continually reinvent herself. And so I'll talk about some of these strategies which, um, in, in her painting, um, which included sort of juxtaposition or, or producing slippages of, of binary categories, appropriation of colonial modes of representation, denial of the male gaze, and production of a, of a monstrous feminine body. Um, Amira's painting, Papua and Arches, is, is probably, from my knowledge, one of her earliest surviving paintings. Um, she would have produced sometime between April 1940 and, and May 1941, when it was exhibited at the first ever Indonesian painters' exhibition at the Dutch Kunstringen in, in Batavia. And these are the, the, the Persagi um, painters out, outside the Kunstring. Um, Amira isn't pictured in, in, this, in this photograph. 
Um, but this particular exhibition is considered a historic moment for modern Indonesian art history. It, it's the first time that Indonesian painters are permitted their own exclusive exhibition within a colonial exhibition space. And Papuan arches would have been exhibited alongside um, celebrated paintings such as Esugiono's before the open Colombo. Now, as we know, the representation of the primitive or sort of noble savage in European tradition was often sustained the imperial ideology that the civilized center was superior. And this was an ideology that was often internalized by a cosmopolitan Indonesian elite, um, a former neighbor um, from the prestigious suburb of Menteng in it, where Amiria lived. Conveyed through all history, she, she described Amiria's paintings as immense, gloomy, frightening affairs that keep you in nightmares for years. And here, the sort of hunter and jungle expanse um, produces an internal other that, that serves to sort of rupture dominant national representations, which were of, of revolution and, and, and socialism, by sort of bringing into view an, an image of the nation's dark, unknown margins. Um, but Amiria produces slippages in, the, in this dichotomy, in the sort of primitive colonial dichotomy by juxtaposing an androgynous primitive figures with sort of a civilized white female portraiture. Um, and so on the back side of, of the painting of the Papuan arches is, is this portrait um, of Mervro O, uh, which was exhibited in, in Amelia's own solo exhibition in 1946, also at the, at the Dutch Kong Spring. Um, so Amelia's paintings are disruptive because they subvert the binary set structured understandings of modernism, center, periphery, rational versus spiritual worlds. And it was these slippages that enabled her performance of the feminine and the princess, and of course her, her anti-colonial politics and support for Papuan self-determination. Um, and I'll just turn um, briefly to also the ways in which Amira's paintings sort of offer possibilities and strategies for rewriting female subjectivity through the trope of the, of the female body. And I'll talk about two periods in, in Amira's painting. Um, the first was from 1941 to the early 1950s, and then later paintings she produced in, in the late 50s. Um, and in the earlier period, I'll show how Amira uses aesthetic strategies, including appropriation of colonial modes of representation and denial of the gaze. Um, this, incidentally, is just a, a portrait of her by um, Ni Xiang Yun. And she was, she was also close to, um, she sort of moved beyond um, just the, the national arts associations, but, and also to um, a group of uh, Chinese painters um, in Batavia at the time. Uh, arguably, nowhere in Indonesia has the sort of oriental gaze upon colonized bodies been as profound as the representation of exotic imagery of the island of Bali. And there's sort of an entire tradition of idyllic scenes of bare-chested women draped in traditional garb, you know, conducting their daily rituals. Such as Hofka's image of Champuan Temple, a sort of a Balinese woman poised near a temple gate, holding offerings to expose the curves of her torso and breast. Now, Amira's portrayal of, of Balinese girl at the stone gate sort of employs the same signifiers as the, as the Hofka image, the female body, the potokendi, and the split stone gates. But Amira doesn't embellish the female form with sort of classical temple, temple architecture. Rather, her female figure is literally wedged between the stone gates of the temple. She depicts the female fawn held captive within its structures and traditions. While she still carries the kendi, she does not raise her arms or shoulders to expose her breasts. And the expression is stern, returning the gaze of the viewer. Another strategy of hers was, was, was denial of, of the gaze, and in, in um, for whom is Nogati waiting, um, painted sometime between 1941 and 1946. Nogati is a, is a Balinese legend whereby one version traces the story of a princess who refuses to marry the prince um, selected for her by her parents. And sort of the irregular position of her feet turned out towards the view is not just a taboo, but serves to frame the painting, creating a, a fourth wall or imaginary wall for the, for the image. And with her back to the viewer, the, the Im image signifies Nogati's refusal to the marriage proposal and also denial of the pleasure of looking at her. And in this way, sort of, Emilia overturns these dominant representations of the colonial image of the native female form 
and its association with exoticism, tradition, and fixity. Um, later in the in the 50s, um, it marks a period of experimentation for Amiria, um, and what I refer to her as her period of self-portraiture. Um, she would have been in, in her early 60s. Um, she hadn't been well, and would have been largely confined to her home. Um, and in this photo, she's in, in front of a house with a collector um, from the House of Co, um, who, who bought this series of paintings um, that I'm going to talk about. And so <coughs> here, um, I describe this period as, as the post-maternal. She, she moves beyond idealized imageries of the female body into, into a monstrous um, female, the antithesis of, of the maternal. And this break with the maternal body is, is represented through a sort of recurring signifier, a, a sort of a large dome or a coconut-shaped breast, which appears in all of Amira's paintings in this series. Amira represents female breasts as swollen, deformed, often detached from the body itself. Her bodies are fragmented, sometimes dismembered. And they are unfinished bodies. And rather than sort of breasts acting as sources of primal nurture, she removes them from the maternal realm and instead places them in, in the domain of, of pleasure. Her bodies are monstrous and were sort of images of the feminine in excess of the prevailing modes of the idealized feminism, feminine in, in colonial national discourses. And Amiri's production of the female grotesque sort of crosses boundary. It, it blurs distinctions and invents new forms for itself. And she also juxtaposed the, the sacred and the profane. Um, this painting in, in 1958, so sort of the naked female body is inscribed with um, Arabic calligraphy, signifying Allah, um, which again questions the sort of structures and, and, and containment, sites of containment of the female body. So as a female post-colonial painter, reclaiming the, the sign of the female body from colonial modes of representation can sort of also be read as an act of em embodied act of retrieving her subjectivity um, as a female. And to conclude, you know, Amelia's visual practice offers what I call points of excess, exit from binary modes of, of thinking that structured the discourses of national and colonial modernisms. Her life and work demands a repositioning of the centre and a rereading from its margins. And in turn, this enables the creation of other meanings and historical possibilities. Thank you. Thank you to our four speakers for very rich and um, enlightening uh, papers. So I'm going to do my duty as a discussant, but I would like to, uh, first of all, disclaimer, this is going to be highly improvised. But um, what I'd like to do is first summarize uh, quickly some of the, our presentations to refresh your memory. And then I will um, offer some comments, and then I can turn to questions. So our first speaker who um, spoke about um, Burma's pioneer modernist, uh, Bagye Ong So, who also um, delved into his own history of um, Buddhism and uh, brought about sort of the question of, and Yen Kira did this very well, how new vocabularies of modernism can include such um, antithetical ideas such as Buddhism that we wouldn't have thought of in the West. But um, uh, she summarized very well how Buddhism and Buddhist ideas can be modern with this idea of mental calculations and sort of conceptualism and uh, the I ideas of Zen and esoteric and uh, Buddhism, which is very interesting if we think of also uh, European and American embrace of Zen Buddhism as uh, something very uh, contemporary as well. Um, she also posed the question of how original or the concept of originality and how and uh, Ong So's own struggles with bringing something new to the discussion of art in Burma without resorting to European tropes 
And uh, the paradox uh, that uh, Yin Kerr exposed is that uh, tradition is not in opposition to modernism. Um, similarly, uh, a nice uh, follow up to those ideas with David's contribution, which is also um, also in contrast to what uh, Yin Kerr brought, which is uh, the um, an opposition between looking locally but also looking internationally or outside of the framework of nationalism. As David uh, spoke about Tang Chang as uh, someone who is both within the sphere of Thailand but also outside of the sphere of Thainess and a kind of a non-conformist Thai who yet still also conforms to the very ideas of uh, the the identities of Thailand. And interestingly, also like uh, Ong So, looked at writing, uh, poetry, uh, in this case, concrete poetry, uh, and um, a use of language uh, as something that is not, that is both sort of form and uh, non form. Uh, and also, what was interesting is that both artists are outside of the chronological ideas of Buddhism, of sort of modernity that we think of in the West, which is the turn of the century. Here are artists uh, working in post World War II, not only post World War II, but the height of sort of Cold War uh, Asia. Um, in contrast to that, we have Emily's contribution of an artist who. Uh, also outside of the framework of modernity as a turn of the century phenomenon, and um, bringing a non-Asian artist to the discussion with uh, Atlan, and yet maybe, maybe not so not Asian as he was born in Algeria, which for Europe is also considered oriental, interestingly. Uh, so she talks about an artist, uh, Atlan, who immigrated to Paris from Algeria but, and also used calligraphy or was inspired by concepts of uh, calligraphy like Chang um, and also interested in spiritual, religious or philosophical ideas, maybe like Ong So as well used his Algerian heritage to reject European ideas of abstraction, looked to Arabic art. And uh, in her analysis, though she also uh, brings in uh, Derrida and his uh, own uh, concepts of writing as something um, that uh, can, is very modern. Heidi, in her very rapid summary of Amiria, a very interesting artist, of course, uh, interesting because she doesn't conform also to our ideas of the Indonesian artist, and nor does she conform to our idea of an Indonesian woman. So brings this uh, idea of uh, feminism or the female body in our discussion of modernity but also raising questions about um, colonialism, anti-colonialism, um, who is an Indonesian painter, that very uh, interesting photograph that didn't include her, but was a photograph of the artist who participated in the first Indonesian painting exhibition. So that's a very cursory summary of, of our, t our, of our uh, presentations, but what I would like to highlight first is this advantage that our um, intelligent uh, organization of this conference to focus on individual artists, which is also reflected in the exhibition upstairs. The focus on individual artists helps us avoid generalizations about how artists conform to certain isms, including uh, modernism and allows us to uh, delve, of course, deeply into the work of an artist and uh, the artist's uh, own individual subjectivity. And in the case of these artists who also refuse to conform to um, preconceived or prescribed notions of modern painting, and yet are also reinforce some of the the backbone of modernity, which is individualism and nonconformity as well. 
So uh, I, I would like to praise this, this emphasis on these individual artists. Um, and of course, modern ideas, uh, modern uh, subjectivities, modern societies also expose kind of, in the case of these artists, the non-modern, uh, how the colonial and the primitive cohabit one another, the national and the universal, the spiritual and the secular, the abstract and the figurative, the magical and the logical, or the mathematical, the scientific, versus the intuitive. Um, this is, of course, also what modernism and the modern is about, which is this dialectic of you can only be modern in contrast or in reference to something in, that is not modern. But the struggles that these, or the challenges that these artists uh, faced was to incorporate that opposition into their artwork as well. So not rejecting it, but also incorporating it. Um, I was struck by the uh, dominance of writing and language, and which is also interesting because these are artists who use their own languages, Burmese, or Pali, Thai, uh, and so forth. And yet, in or Arabic, uh, in their use of it as an art form, we are, I noticed how non-specific to those languages these writings were. They become form, they become poetry, they become lyrical, they meld into a kind of shapelessness uh, and fluidity and that is also um, uh, not of their, uh, of their own vocabulary. Which brings us to this idea of universalism and the universalism of modernity as a something that all of these artists were trying to embrace, to be local and not local, to be universal and of their own uh, history. So that is very briefly my uh, contribution. Um, I'm not going to, I'm going to open it up to questions, but if any of the speakers would like to also engage in a kind of a response or a discussion, I'll, I'll leave it to you first before opening up to the audience. Anybody want to respond to some of the presentation? Yes? Yes, okay. Um, two questions with regard to Tang, tang Chang. Um, concrete poems. I'm just curious, the term concrete, is that a translation from Thai? Did he come up with the name concrete, or how did it come about? And then the second question is, I noticed that he signed um, well, in, in Thailand, I think usually they, they use the Buddhist era, but he signed like 1980, 1988, so on and so forth. So I'm just curious, so was he like addressing an international audience in his mind? Why use the international year instead of the Buddhist era? I'll answer the second bit first. Um, I wondered that a lot myself. I don't really have a satisfactory explanation, and I'm still asking. Um, the artist's son does not have a very compelling uh, answer to that question. But I, at the same time, it was not uncommon for modernist inclined artists of the mid-century in, in Thailand to do that. Um, in fact, I think it would be more probably safer to say, and others here may have a better answer to this, but I think it would be safe to say that generally speaking, the modernism that had uh, been accommodated and gradually domesticated by the end of the 60s and early 70s in uh, the academic system in Thailand, um, there, there is an innate address of the international. Right? Modernism, modern art begins as a heterogeneous and international sort of style and project. Uh, its founder is an Italian. Um, there is already that. I would say it's an always already international address, actually, to some degree. Um, until much later, really the late 70s, when neo-traditionalism kind of kicks in, then arguably there's a more nativist sort of address. Um, the first bit about concrete, the attribution concrete poetry, I have, I have uh, approached this very tentatively. Um, this connection between the work he was doing and 
not specifically Brazilian uh, modernist poetry, but but a, a kind of internationalist um, you know meme of of concrete poetry, which of course you know has a, another heritage in Europe, uh, in Dada and surrealism and so on. Um, was something that, as far as I know, um, the attribution, as far as I know, comes from foreign observers in Bangkok at the time. There was, for example, uh, a, a kind of story circulating about some Italian impresario who in the 60s uh, had promised Tung Chung that he would make a, a monograph of his concrete poetry. Uh, that story hasn't really yielded any compelling evidence yet, so I, I can't really comment on it. The answer is, I don't know, but I would be, I would not be surprised if the attribution of that term came from not non-Thai. Uh, I'd be, yeah, I would almost assume that it came from a non-Thai source. It's not a translation. Thank you. Any other? Okay, we can open up uh, Roger. Their microphone for yeah thanks. Thank you, <clears throat> everyone, for a wonderful morning, wonderfully stimulating. Uh, my question, uh, it's a question for Emily, uh, um, but the the issue also applies to Chang, who David spoke about so eloquently, which is the question of the sort of disappearance of some of these artists from the national art historical record. So Emily, in the case of Atlan, I was very struck by your comments at the end that he has no presence really in the writing of Algerian art history now, um, despite the efforts of influential historians like Benjamin Stora to, to reinstate him. And could you tell us more please about why you think this artist who had been recognized by Mohammed Hada was lost. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, there are many reasons. Um, um, at first, um, the constriction of uh, modernism in Algeria after independence it's uh, in the same time a revendication of uh, identitaire, I don't know in English, identi identity, uh, identity uh, revendication. So um, perhaps uh, more Algerian Muslim artists are in this story uh, insert, uh, in introduced, then uh, French, uh, French, uh, French uh, modern uh, painter. Um, Anissa Bouayed and Benjamin Stora uh, said about that uh, the Jewish Berberish, uh, Berber uh, um, origin of Atlan as maybe in the national construction of uh, uh, Algerian uh, history of art uh, plays in this absence. And I think, too, uh, that um, Atlan was, uh, uh, was in the frame of uh, European artists. So in, uh, in the collection, modern collection, and maybe it's the second reason of this uh, absence. John and then Adele. Yeah, this is a very interesting figure and uh, Roger's question could be followed up by saying, why did he attract so many stellar intellectuals and poets to his cause? And isn't the problem the problem of hybridity, the problem of being space, placed between cultures? Isn't the problem that he's neither European nor Arab nor Muslim? Why um, it's um, um, for the thinker about uh, Atlan? It's interesting that uh, uh, Derrida was uh, too bound with Algeria. It's an interesting fact, 
and um, I say uh, I said in my uh, pap uh, paper that um, uh, Atlant was in the artistic scene of Paris and know many uh, figures of uh, art scene. So um, friendly uh, with a friendly sh uh, friendly uh, uh, relationships. So it's uh, it's maybe too uh, why we are uh, um, lost uh, a lot of um, uh, publication about uh, Atlant too. But I think at uh, uh, to sum up. Um, Atlan was very modern, and uh, he he he, he made correction of uh, theory of, of modernism. Uh, Adele, did you question? Hi, um, I have a question for David, which is following it in the vein of uh, the first question posed by Inca. I was wondering about your deployment of the descriptive or categorical term of action painting, which was uh, coined by Harold Rosenberg to describe the painting of Tang Chang. Was that to index the impact of Cold War ideology in Thailand? And where or how might we invoke the traditions of Chinese abstract in painting traditions uh, and literati painting? And then also a last stray question. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to find out a bit more about the odd place of self-portraiture in the oeuvre of Tang Chang and how should we situate that because it, it didn't figure in your presentation. Thanks Adele. Uh, great questions. Um, action painting, can we use it with a small a and a small p? <laughs> because that would pretty much solve it for me. Um, Surely there is a very obvious resemblance in some of the, particularly some of the larger works on canvas. Um, you know, I think it's there's almost less reason to quibble with that than there is with the the attribution of concrete poetry, because I think concrete poetry is tapping into these kind of currencies of the contemporary that that I was talking about a lot more, um, whereas the currency, so to speak, of, of action painting, I think, is, is, is so well established and so imperious in, in, in art history and, the, and market history um, that it's, I mean, it's, it's completely obvious to me that it's, that the success and value of these works as they are disinterred is going to come from there. And I think that's already clear in the interest that's been shown in his work. Um, what, what's interesting to me is, well, how do you valorize the, the works on paper? So I guess that's why that explains the slant. Um, I suppose I should be, to be a, if I was a more responsible art historian, which I'm not really, um, I, I would be approaching the term action painting with a similarly tentative, um, in a similarly tentative manner. Uh, how to situate self-portraiture is an excellent question uh, uh, to which I, I don't have a very satisfactory answer. Um, he was uh, engaged in self-portraiture, as far as I know, throughout his practice, uh, throughout his, his entire career. There was, however, a moment um, which the selections for the current exhibition, I believe, kind of uh, draws a line under, which is, which is the, the moment in the 70s where, for a time, he abandoned painting. Um, so one of the works that's on show here, most of the works I showed in the slideshow, the paintings are from the 60s predominantly. Uh, the, the big work that's on show here uh, was painted supposedly in response to Sipsi Tula, the, the 14th of October uh, atrocities in Bangkok in 1973, uh, which indeed is the title, the date is the title of that work. Um, and this is a self-portrait and, and a very uh, in-your-face kind of self-portrait. So it's clear that in, in, uh, at the same time as doing, um, or more or less the same time as doing completely abstract work, completely non-figurative work that you would have to say is uh, you know, expressionistic, if not expressionist, um, in, in the sense of a, an international uh, modernism that was circulating uh, probably predominantly in the form of printed 
reproductions um, in the 60s. Um, Self-portraiture is somehow not entirely figurative in his work. And this, I think, would be a way into talking about the, the works on paper as well. Um, is it possible that self-portraiture is, that, that one could render oneself in a visual image in a way that was not entirely figurative or uh, in, any, in any case not entirely uh, retinal? And I think that, that this is perhaps also a way to link the works on paper, which some of which, as you have seen in the galleries, are also kind of naivest form of self-portraiture, also with the, the works that are really the most gestural, the most capital A, capital E abstract expressionist, um, you know, which is also, of course, a kind of performative self-portraiture, right, in the manner of an Eve Klein or of a, of a Jackson Pollock, perhaps, right? So I, th I think this would be how I would approach it, would be to say that is self-portraiture, when it, when it kind of looks like him, it, it may nevertheless be abstract art, um, to try to sort of undo um, the close association of uh, self-portraiture with a figurative tradition as such. That would be my speculative response. Uh, Nora, yeah, I just want to... The I just said I want a fact about, about the self-portrait upstairs. Unfortunately, the portrait upstairs does not have a full description of why that painting was made. It refers to the 14th of October massacre in 1973, but uh, I know, and David knows from the artist who told us, uh, who was studying poetry with Dang Chang at the time, that the picture was actually painted, um, and she told, as she was told by Dang Chang himself, um, it was actually painted to show his desperation at the loss of his son, who had gone missing in the demonstrations of 14th October. So he'd actually thought he'd lost his only son at that time. It's not, it's always presented as a public commemoration of an event, but it's actually a very personal memory of the loss of this child, about whom he was absolutely desperate. Fortunately, the child came back, like a lot of parents at the time. But I was going to add, you know, to, to reflect on the self is so modern idea as well. So it's kind of interesting that, that I, I find your comments really interesting about also this conscious, you know, gestures and sort of performativity, which might also reflect that self that many of the papers also talked about inner selves and kind of, you know, delving into inner being. Okay, another question? Yes, over here. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I am curious about the distorted iconography, Buddhist iconography, and or maybe I'm perceiving there's a distortion in the iconography that um, Baji Aung Soi has in his artwork. How was that accepted by the authorities? And with the same token, possibly this particular artwork too, that's right here. Uh, so, you know, there's religious, especially in Burma, where there's such a um, strong, I would say a religious <laughs> state imposed sanctions um, when you tend to distort Buddhist iconography. How, how is it accepted or how was it not accepted? Mm, I think in his representations of the Buddha, um, the, the, the marks of the Buddha image, they're still there, like the earth touching mudra, the snail shell coins, the Ugna, the Usnisha, they're all there. It's really just in terms of the proportions. And I don't think, to my knowledge at, at least, he was never looked upon as um, doing something disrespectful. Well, to a large extent, it's also because he was very much perceived as someone a little bit crazy. <laughs> and I think he played that up quite a bit as well so that he could do whatever he wanted to. And let's say the, uh, in, the authorities were definitely not supportive of his works, but he, he was good friends with the writers, the editors, the poets, so on and so forth. 
and the artist looked up to him a lot. So he had all this support from his peers, the writers, and the artists. So, and he was able to do whatever he wanted to do um, through the medium of illustration as well. So he managed to get away with what he wanted to, although I think there were times whereby he had to censor some of his works when it had to be published. Otherwise, he just did his works. He kept them at home. He wasn't keen on selling them. So the, I think the public opinion or the authority's opinion on him couldn't really stop him from doing what he wanted to do, since he was not dependent on their opinion to, for, for subsistence, for example. Yeah. We have time for one more question. I have a question for Heidi. Um, I was just interested to, um, if you can share a little bit more about um, Emeria's relationship with the Pasagi boys, if you like. And also, um, in <laughs> extension to that, is um, whether in your research you found out about what Emeria actually thought about the, um, you know, the works of other artists um, that are happening around her during that time. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Ulan? Yeah, there's, there's a story behind that, uh, conflicting stories, like sort of everything related to Amiri, really. And um, S. Sujoyono never regarded her a, me a, a member of Parasagi, um, whereas Agus Jaya, who was sort of the, the second guy in charge, had noted that she was, and that she was, she was um, written in the books. Um, and I suppose that really, you know, it, it, it's, it depends on how you want to look at membership within the context of how sort of these kind of um, uh, collective art associations are, are formed, um, you know, from, from that period and to this very day. In Indonesia, they're quite often very sort of loose um, associations and the ones I know don't, certainly don't sort of, you know, um, you don't have to have your name written down in order to be a member. Um, what is clear, though, that is that she, of all the Pasagi exhibitions, of which there were, I, from my knowledge, there were only three, um, she exhibited in all of them. In, in each one of them, she, she had paintings. Um, and so she, she was included in, in, in that sense. I think, I think what you've got to also to keep in mind, though, was that, you know, Amelia was 46 years of age when she started painting, and, and the Pasagi boys were sort of still in their, in their mid-20s, um, early 30s, you know, and so there was a, there was also a sort of an age gap. She was probably considered sort of the, you know, the the old aunt or tanta of you know of, but nevertheless included. Um, in terms of um, what she thought, un unfortunately, there, there's really very very little um, in the sort of archival documents about what Amiria thought about art at all, um, other than her politics. Really, it's you know all of the sort of the the um, documented um, uh, material, printed material on her is really um, about her staking claim to, again, this identity of the princess of, of Tidore and, and, and um, Papuan self-determination. There's a little bit um, about her own personal history and, again, her other sort of stories around, around marriage and sort of other adventures that she had. But, but really nothing to sort of mark, yeah, um, you know, what inspired her, who influenced her, these kind of questions, yeah. So that concludes our uh, session this morning. Um, we have a lunch break now, and we will resume at 2 for Roger Benjamin's keynote. Thank you, everyone.